fantastic. And are you all seeing? Okay. Yes, we can see the screen. Okay. All right. So, wow, we have quite a few in the room. So, hello and good morning to the A team currently joining us via Zoom. Um, so, we'll get started in just one second, um, and then we'll get right into it. So, Julia, good morning we to. See, we don't see presenter view. We see like your your notes and things. Oh, yes, oh you Julia. do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. No problem. All right, well, we get uh, our PowerPoint situated to our guests. So good morning to everybody. My name is Tatiana Calderon. Um, I just wanna give you guys a moment just to get situated. So if you need anything, please do so now. Um, I want to uh, also announce that this uh, presentation will uh, be providing simultaneous Spanish interpretation. For now, I will give those instructions to our Spanish attendees. So buenos dias a los que se reúnen con nosotros aquí en Zoom. Hoy y siempre brindamos servicios de interpretación simultánea para nuestros eventos aquí en Zoom. Um, so, por favor, hacer clic en el fondo um, de su pantalla en el globo donde dice interpretación. Luego haga clic en el idioma que desee escuchar, en este caso español. Si solo quiere escuchar al intérprete, puede también hacer clic en Mute Original Audio, que silenciará el audio original. Um, el audio original. So, muchísimas gracias de nuevo. Bienvenidos a Sinergia. Estamos agradecidos de tenerlos aquí. Um, right before we begin, I want to let you know we are broadcasting this presentation live via Facebook. Um, so, you know, just remember for our audience, this is a public forum. Um, we encourage questions at any time. I just ask that if there's um, names of minors involved and things like that. We keep that information private. Just, you know, again, this is a public forum. Um, there will uh, be a poll activated at the end of this presentation. So I encourage you to please stick around at the end just to fill that out. It really helps us here at the Parent Center. Um, and just a brief introduction about Synergia's Autism Initiative. So for those that don't know me, again, my name is Tatiana Calderon. I'm the Autism Initiative Coordinator here at Synergia's Metropolitan Parent Center. Um, just a few words about the Autism Initiative. The Autism Initiative is a project that is funded by a grant from the New York City Council under its Autism Initiative. This project supplements the work of Synergia's Metropolitan Parent Center by bringing increased awareness to New York City residents, particularly to the communities with large Spanish-speaking populations about the growing population of children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Um, its strong outreach component targets families um, of children with a suspected or known diagnosis of ASD who are not receiving appropriate educational, health, or other related services. The initiative will link them to other services and supports that will meet the individual needs of children and families. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. Um, here today we have Juliet and Alex, who are the assistant project director and the project director for the post-secondary readiness project at Advocates for Children. Thank you so much, guys, for being here today and for joining us at Synergia. So now I will be handing off the mic to them to get us started in this presentation. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you all for having us today. So we are going to be talking today about the transition to adulthood for students with disabilities. As Tatiana said, Alex and I are from Advocates for Children of New York, um, which is an education advocacy organization in the city. So today's training, first we will have our introduction, which we are doing now. Then we will review graduation options for students with IEPs, because that can be a really key part of the transition planning process. Then we're gonna discuss what transition planning looks like on the IEP. And finally, we are going to discuss transition services beyond the IEP. Okay, so just to get us started, um, a brief overview in case you're not familiar with our organization. Advocates for Children is an independent agency that protects the rights of all New York City students. We have a helpline um, that families, professionals, uh, students can call at any time um, to leave a voicemail if uh, 
it's not during their operating hours uh, with educational questions and concerns. And we also have a lot of guides and resources on our website, advocatesforchildren.org. And finally, like we are doing here, we provide workshops and trainings um, in addition to free legal services to families. Okay, so I also will, um, at the end of each of the sections that I just previewed, we will pause for questions um, to make sure that I'm getting all questions that come up in the chat or the Q&A, but feel free to ask questions whenever and, and we'll get to them at the end of each section. So to start, um, we're gonna do a brief overview of what high school graduation options are for students with IEPs. So to begin this conversation, it's important to know that students with IEPs have the right to stay in school until they earn a diploma or until their 22nd birthday, whichever comes first. There's a star next to the 22nd birthday because that date is a little bit up in the air right now. Um, right now, students who have already turned 22 this year should have the right to complete the school year um, within New York City. But moving forward, uh, New York City might switch back to only allowing students to stay in school until their 21st birthday. We're not sure yet. But generally speaking, students with IEPs have the right to stay in school until they meet one of these two benchmarks. So what can you leave high school with? There are diploma options and there are non-diploma credentials. So for diploma options, you could leave high school with an advanced regents diploma, a regents diploma, a local diploma, or a high school equivalency diploma, otherwise known as the GED. All of these are diplomas. They will get you into college, the military, anything that requires a high school diploma. They all serve that purpose. On the right side of the screen are non-diploma credentials. These are not diplomas, they will not be enough to get you into college, into the military, or into any job that requires a high school diploma. So the first of these is called a CDOS, or a Career Development and Occupational Studies Commencement Credential, which is why we call it CDOS, because it's a, a very long uh, credential name. And we also have the Skills and Achievement Commencement Credential, which people call the SAC. There used to be something called an IEP diploma, um, and that was what the SAC has now replaced. Um, it was a really confusing name because it had the word diploma in it, even though it was not a diploma. And so New York City uh, got rid of that credential option. So if you hear anyone using the term IEP diploma, um, they are really referring to what we now call a SAC. Okay, so how do you know if your student is working towards a diploma or towards a non-diploma credential? Here, your student's IEP plays a really important role. Towards the back of your student's IEP, there's a box that says participate in state and district-wide assessments. And there are two boxes and one of them will be checked. If the first box is checked, which says the student will participate in the same state and district-wide assessments of student achievement that are administered to general education students, that means that the student is working towards a high school diploma. So any of the options that were on the left side of the screen before, including advanced regents, regents, local diploma. Um, if the second box is checked, which say, states that the student will participate in an alternate assessment on a particular state or district-wide assessment of student achievement, that means that the student is not diploma bound. That means they are working towards a non-diploma credential, such as a SAC. They are not going to be working towards a diploma and they will not be able to use their credential to enter college, the military, or any job that requires a high school diploma. 
So this is a really key part of the IEP that you can always check to see what um, pathway your student is on. And if you think that your student is not on the right pathway, this is an issue that you can bring up at an IEP meeting and advocate um, for a change because only students with pretty significant uh, cognitive and adaptive disabilities should be alternately assessed according to state guidelines. So I'm gonna quickly review um, the non-diploma credentials and what they entail, and then we'll go into the diploma. Okay, so the first of the non-diploma credentials is the SAC. As I just said, this is for students with severe disabilities who are alternately assessed, which means that they are not working towards a diploma. Um, a SAC requires that students attend school for at least 12 years, not including pre-K or kindergarten. And it comes with a student exit summary. So this will be a document that outlines your students' academic achievements, their progress towards CDOS standards, which I will get to in the next slide, and their skills, strengths, and interests. This document is meant to help set the student up for success in their life after high school. But again, it is not a diploma. It's really more a summary of their achievements and abilities and, and what they might be able to do after high school. Another non-diploma credential is the CDOS. So the CDOS can be on its own uh, used as a non-diploma credential, but it actually is unique because a student who is working towards a diploma can also work towards a CDOS. So a CDOS is available to any student and you also do not need to have an IEP to work towards a CDOS. Um, for students who are working towards a diploma, and I will get to those requirements in a second, you can replace one of the required regents exams with a CDOS credential. So that's how a student who is working towards a diploma would use the CDOS. For a student not working towards a diploma, they would work towards the CDOS to get work-based learning experiences. The CDOS entails about four credits worth of work-based learning experiences, which can include internships, CTE courses, and other uh, job training experiences to help the students document their entry-level work skills. Okay, I'm now gonna go into the diploma pathways. So what does it take to get a diploma in New York City? And importantly, this is New York City specific, not even New York State. Because in New York State, they calculate credits a little bit differently than they do in New York City. So first you need 44 credits, and there's an exam requirement of four plus one exams, and then you get a high school diploma. So, sorry, I'll just step back for a second. So these are the requirements for any of the diplomas that I mentioned before, except the GED, because the GED does not have a credit requirement and it has its own subtests that are required. But generally for an advanced regents diploma, a regents diploma, and a local diploma, these are the minimum requirements. The advanced regents diploma will require additional credits. Um, and I will get into how a local diploma um, offers a little bit more flexibility, but generally these are the requirements. And in the four plus one exams, that plus one, that's where the CDOS could come in and replace that optional fifth uh, Regents exam, or I shouldn't say optional, but um, a Regents exam of your choice is the plus one, um, and that could be replaced with the CDOS credential so that a student might only have to take four exams um, and then could use the CDOS credential as their fifth. But all students will need at least 44 credits in the right areas in order to graduate. Okay, so now I'm going to get into what a local diploma looks like specifically because that is a unique option that students with IEPs have access to. So a local diploma is available to anyone with or without disabilities, with or without IEPs, 
who have successfully appealed two regents exam scores. So if you have two regents exams that you have scored below passing on and you appeal those scores to get a passing score, you can then graduate with a local diploma. English language learners also have access to a local diploma if they appeal their ELA region scores, if they did not get a passing score on their ELA regions. And finally, the category that I am going to focus on is that students with IEPs or 504 plans um, who use safety nets or a superintendent determination will graduate with a local diploma. So I will talk about what that means in the next few slides. Um, but this is a way that students with disabilities have a little bit more flexibility in meeting graduation requirements. So the first safety net that students with disabilities have access to is a low pass safety net. While generally the passing score on a regents exam is a 65, students with disabilities can score a 55 on their regents exams one in ELA, one in math, one in science, and one in history, and then the plus one exam or CDOS, um, and they will get a local diploma. So they will still get a diploma. They are allowed to score 10 points below what is generally considered the passing score, and they will still graduate. And they would still have to meet the 44 credit requirements in addition to these exams. The next a uh, way that a student with a disability can get a local diploma is through what we call the compensatory safety net. So this means that, and actually before I go into this, um, there's one more quick way um, that the low pass safety net works that I wanna briefly mention is that um, if a student actually gets a, a 52 to a 54 and appeals those lower scores, you can also um, get a local diploma using this low pass safety net option. So students with disabilities, even who score below a 55, as low as a 52, can appeal those scores um, to get a local diploma. Okay, sorry, now back to the compensatory safety net. Um, students who score a 45 to a 54 on either science or history can balance those lower scores with higher scores on their other regents exams. So the important thing here is that you cannot score below a 55 in ELA or math. You have to score at least a 55 or above or appeal scores of 52 to 54 on ELA or math um, in order to use this option. But for instance, if you get a 65 or 66 in this example on science, then you can balance that out with a lower score in history. And that will count as a local diploma, even though on its own, a 45 would not be a passing score. This is a confusing concept. Um, and we have a guide on our website that really um, walks through what this option can look like because I know it can cause a lot of confusion. In addition, because there's the plus one requirement, don't forget that you will still need that, that plus one exam requirement in this scenario. The final way that students can work towards um, a local diploma as a student with a disability is through what's called the superintendent determination. So this is, while the previous option I've, I've talked about are available for both students with IEPs and students with 504 plans, the superintendent determination is only available for students with IEPs. And there's a few ways that you can get it. So the first is by scoring at least a 55 on your math and ELA regions, and you fail the rest. The second way is you score a 52 plus on ELA or math, appeal those scores to get a 55, and then you fail the other three exams. The final way that you can get a superintendent determination is 
by getting your CDAS credential, which is the work-based learning experience credential, and failing your exams, but attempting to pass them. If you meet one of these three pathways, then there's a form that parents can fill out online that basically applies for a superintendent determination from your district superintendent. Your student will have had to pass all of their classes. They will have had to attempt all of the Regents exams required at least twice. And then the superintendent will make a determination as to whether that student can get a local diploma via the superintendent determination pathway. So here is an outline of what that process looks like. And the information is online as well on the DOE's website. The superintendent's decision is final. There are no appeals available. OK, that is a very brief overview of high school graduation requirements for students with disabilities. We have trainings that are 90 minutes on this topic alone, so that was certainly a really fast um, description, but let me just pause for questions. I see we have a few questions in the Q&A. So a private, so the first question asks, what diploma does a private school provide? Private schools do not follow the requirements that I've just outlined because these are for New York City public schools. A private school would uh, provide an independent school diploma. And generally, they have their own credit requirements, and they do generally not have exam requirements. That said, some private schools do offer a Regents diploma. And for that reason, you still could be working towards a Regents diploma at a private school, but most private schools just issue an independent school diploma. OK, the second question, does Spanish Regents count as a CDAS? So, Spanish is a language other than English exam that a student can take. Um, and yes, that it doesn't, it's not a CDOS, but it would count as your plus one exam requirement. So there are four exams that are always required, ELA, math, science, and social studies. And then you have your plus one exam option, and that requirement can be met through a CDOS but it can also be met through an exam like the language, language other than English exam. Um, and that would, that would meet the plus one requirement. Thank you, Juliet. And I can translate the following question for you. Um, basically they're Thank asking, you. so from what age um, you have to have in the IEP that the diploma is the goal. Uh, for example, uh, this parent states that their child is currently finishing eighth grade and will be going into high school. So when should they discuss it with the IEP team? Got it. So this is a really great question. And for every student, it's different. But generally, if your child has a really significant disability, they will be on a non-diploma track, which we also call an alternate assessment track from a very young age. So it's not something that will just get added to their IEP after eighth grade. It is something that will be on their IEP starting in elementary school. So it shouldn't be new information or a surprise to you when your child enters high school, what pathway they are on. That said, if perhaps a disability or a difficulty is coming to light um, at the end of middle school or in high school, uh, when they are, um, you know, transferring to a new setting, the academic um, impact is getting a lot harder. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to switch to an alternate assessment track. It just might mean that they need a different placement to give them more support. Um, but generally, the decision as to whether your child is working towards a diploma or a non-diploma credential is not something that should first be discussed when your student is entering high school. Um, your school should let you know if your student is not working towards a diploma uh, well before that, based on the significance of 
you know, a cognitive disability or, um, yeah. And I saw that that person said that their son only has autism. So yes, autism alone would not be um, sufficient to put a student on an alternate assessment track. A student with autism can of course still work towards a high school diploma. Um, it would really depend on if that student also has um, a significant intellectual disability that would make it really difficult for them to meet the high school graduation requirements. Typically students on an alternate assessment pathway have significant intellectual disabilities as well. And that in fact is part of the legal criteria for putting a student on an alternate assessment track. Thank okay. you, Julia. And um, before we go on to the next question, I just want to bring it back to the private school. Just wanted to clarify that if private school is different from an independent school in terms of the diploma that they would receive, or is that just the same information? Yeah, so private, private schools award independent school diplomas. Um, they are part of a, like there's an academic conference that's called, I forget, what the acronym is, but it's uh, a independent school consortium and they all award independent school diplomas. So when I say independent school, that's actually, it's, they're using the word interchangeably and like independent and private are being used interchangeably, but they call it independent school diplomas. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is a local diploma only accepted in New York. This is a great question. And no, a local diploma is a high school diploma. The only state that knows the difference between a local diploma and a regents diploma is New York. Outside of New York, no one cares. If you have a local diploma, you can apply to a college outside of New York. You have a high school diploma and it is seen as a high school diploma. Who might care is a SUNY or CUNY might look at a local diploma and look to see um, if they might want that student to uh, take perhaps additional course loads or um, you know some sort of remedial um, class that you know maybe they hadn't passed a regents exam for, um, but generally a local diploma is a high school diploma both in New York and out of New York. Um, CUNYs and SUNYs sometimes look at them a little more critically, but Generally, it is a diploma and, and that is the most important thing to remember. It is no different than any other high school diploma. All right, and the um, next question I can translate for you. Yeah. Um, parents uh, states that what grade uh, would you sit down and talk with the school about which of the two paths is more appropriate for your child? I think I would, I mean, whenever you could, there's no right or wrong time whenever you feel ready. Um, I think middle school, especially before the transition to high school, it's an important time to have the conversation if you're not sure. But again, your student should only be on an alternate assessment pathway if they have really significant intellectual and uh, adaptive functioning disabilities where they really struggle with communication, with being verbal, um, and have pretty significant deficits in their learning. And so you generally would know if your student is on a non-diploma pathway from a young age. Um, but I would say if you haven't had that conversation, you can ask anytime. And I would certainly make sure to ask before high school to make sure that your student is on a diploma pathway if they should be. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure I understand this question. Just to clarify, you said that the student with an IEP can also get the local diploma if he or she works towards the CDOS and appeals it if he or she fails the regions. Yes, okay, so I think this question is referring to the superintendent determination. Um, so one of the ways that you can get a local diploma is through the superintendent determination pathway. And through this pathway, um, a student has to sit for the regents twice, all, all of the required regents. So that's five exams um, or four exams and a CDOS. They must sit for the exams twice, not pass them. They must pass all of their required courses. And then 
assuming they have a CDOS credential that they've met the requirements for, they will get a local diploma. Yes. Okay. If a student is on a diploma track, then regressed during COVID, and the school does not provide the support needed for a student to catch up. How can a parent address this deficit with the DOE or the local CSE? Yeah, um, that is a great question, something I see all the time. Um, I think the first step here would be to um, request a reevaluation, perhaps, from the DOE or the CSE to get a better sense of where your student is now, you know, after remote learning has ended, um, to see what supports they need and what they could benefit from. Um, you can also still at IEP meetings ask for supports such as compensatory services due to COVID learning loss. So that's something that you can always bring up at an IEP meeting. And there is, you know, a, a box on your student's IEP that, um, you know, asks whether, whether your student does need compensatory services due to, um, you know, the impact of COVID-19. And so that is something you can always bring up at an IEP meeting. And if you need more information to understand what they now need, I would ask for additional evaluations to understand um, how, how the DOE can best support them. Okay. When can you switch from the alternative assessment pathway to the diploma one? How is the process for the switch? Okay, I'm just gonna take a sip of water. So this is a really important question. And usually in these slides, I actually include the legal standard for uh, alternate, for putting a, a child on alternate assessment. And I didn't because this was an abbreviated version, but generally, um, if you Google New York State alternate assessment, you'll see the legal standards um, online. So you have them in front of you and I can send them out or I can, I can share them with Tatiana so she can send them out with the slides. But generally, in order to be on alternate assessment, you need to show both that the student has significant cognitive disability and significant adaptive functioning deficits. So that means that a student struggles both a lot with learning and also with activities of daily living. So they might have trouble getting dressed by themselves in the morning or doing, you know, other tasks independently. So there's a really strict standard for what it takes to be on an alternative assessment pathway in the first place. And New York State says that only about 1% of students should be on alternate assessment. So if you think that your student is on that alternate assessment pathway, and that is not the right pathway for them, what I would do is request an IEP meeting, have that legal criteria in front of you, and explain why your student does not meet that legal criteria for alternative assessment, and ask that they be switched to a diploma pathway. You can do this. I have done it before, but it takes advocacy. Um, but you can always request an IEP meeting and, and explain and show why your student doesn't meet that criteria because it is really strict criteria and it's only meant to really serve about 1% of the student population. Okay, a local diploma is what they used to call an IEP diploma or are they different? They are different. A local diploma is a diploma. I will scream this from the rooftops if I could. It is a diploma. An IEP diploma is what they now call a SAC, a Skills and Achievement Commencement Credential, not a diploma. That's why they switched the name because IEP diploma makes it sound like it's a diploma and it's not. So what was an IEP diploma is now a SAC. What was a local diploma is still a local diploma, which is a high school diploma. Okay. If the DOE or CSC is not providing related services for your child in high school, but related services were provided previously, what is their liability? Um, that would depend why the services were removed. 
If you think your student still needs those services, I would request new evaluations in those areas to see um, whether they still need those services. If those services are still on the student's IUP, but they are not receiving them, then you can ask for what's called a related services authorization or an RSA to get those services outside of school. Okay. Thank you, Julia. And we do have one more in the chat. Oh, so sorry. Um, yeah, it's all right. It says, um, where are my daughter's IP report? Should it have a check mark as to see if she's eligible to attend regular classes? So is that specifically about alternative versus standard assessment? I'm yes. Ms. Okay. Ross, if you could clarify um, about your question in terms of if she's eligible to attend regular classes, are you referring to alternate assessment versus the diploma track? We'll just give her a minute. Okay. Um, in the meantime, Juliet, um, just to be sure, if the school is recommending an alternate assessment pathway, does, the school does need to provide current evaluations to demonstrate this, correct? Yes, they would need to. If they've been alternately assessed for years, they're not going to provide new evaluations every year to show. But generally, if they are making that switch, yes, they would need evaluations that show current evaluations that show why they are making the switch. Thank you. And I will assume for the sake of Ms. Ross's question that she is asking about standard versus alternate assessment. Um, and I you know, can answer differently if that's not the case, but yes. So regular versus special is, um, yes, that's called standard assessment versus alternate assessment. Um, so if we just go back a few slides, I'll show you the box. So here's the box. Um, it's usually within the last three pages of a student's IEP, but I don't want to tell you one way or another, you know, it might be in the last five pages. It's usually towards the end of the IEP. Um, and this is exactly what it looks like. Like this is literally a screenshot of a student's IEP. So take a screenshot of this. We'll also be sharing the slides after so you can use this box and compare it. Um, but look for a box towards the back of the IEP that says participate in state and district-wide assessments. And that is where you will find this information. Okay. Yes. Okay. Final question is about if there's a list of DOE related service providers um, that's active. All we have is is the list that the DOE shares. Um, unfortunately, I too email that list often to see who responds. I wish that the CSE would update that list, but alas, um, we're we're working with those resources as well. I generally for what it's worth, send a mass email to the emails on that list and, and see who responds. But yes, it is really tedious. And you can always ask your school for support um, in reaching out. They are, you know, they have an obligation to help you find a provider. And so never be afraid to ask your school, hey, can you find a provider that accepts your rate? Um, and, you know, they, they should follow up with you. Okay, and in the chat, okay. I would have to answer Ms. Ross, your question. Um, you know, after the webinar, we can talk, but um, it might be because your daughter is, is too young right now. Um, it's it's hard to say, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss that more offline. Okay. Okay. So we are now going to get to the next section of the training, which is transition planning on the IAP. So this is the section where we talk about how can you start transition planning for your student um, during IEP meetings. And Julia, um, oh, yeah. just right before we get into it, um, can you just one last question? Yes. Um, have you seen a high percentage of students who attend non-public schools who are working towards diplomas? Yes. 
there are so it really depends on the non-public school that the student is attending but a lot of non-public schools serve students who are working towards diplomas but for instance have a significant learning disability and so they need more support um, to meet diploma requirements or to you know pass classes but yes you can certainly be working towards a diploma at a non-public school okay mr ross i see your comment in the chat as well and let's talk after the webinar um, so that we can figure out this mystery okay so transition planning on the iep so just as background so that you all are equipped with the tools that you need, um, know that everything I'm about to share with you comes from the law, the federal law, which is the IDEA, state law, the New York State Education Department regulations, and city law, the New York City Standard Operating Procedures Manual. These are all linked in this slide, um, but know that there is a basis for everything that I'm about to explain, and that can be a really helpful tool to uh, go into IEP meetings knowing. Okay, so this is what New York State says. And this is an interpretation of federal law. So federal law says this as well. Um, but when a student with a disability turns 15 and earlier, if appropriate, the IEP team must create a program for them updated annually that includes one, a statement of the student's needs taking into account their strengths, preferences, and interests as they relate to transition from school to post-school activities. Two, appropriate measurable post-secondary goals based upon age-appropriate transition assessments. Three, the necessary activities to facilitate the student's movement from school to post-school activities, and four, a statement of the responsibilities of the school district and when applicable participating agencies for the provision of such services. All to say, there is a lot of language in the law that basically says, New York City Department of Education, you have a legal responsibility to help prepare my student to transition from high school to post high school life. And I'm gonna break each of these components down and talk about them one by one now. Okay, so though this is not the order that the law writes it in, I'm gonna go in the logical order that you would approach transition planning in. The first step in that is age appropriate transition assessments. So actually, um, the law says, not in the part that I just quoted, but elsewhere, that beginning at age 12, um, the DOE should be uh, offering age-appropriate transition assessments to students with IEPs to identify their needs, strengths, preferences, and interests. These assessments are supposed to be conducted every year and then used to create a transition plan that is individualized, specific, and attainable for your student. And it's done every year so that they're continually assessing your student's progress towards and the appropriateness of their post-secondary goals. The real goal of this all is to empower, educate, and prepare students for a successful future, really using them as the driving force. Um, of transition planning. So as I just mentioned, there are requirements that go along with this, This, which is one, these assessments should start when a student turn, with an IEP turns 12. Um, and there's some requirements as to what they should include. So these assessments typically include interviews with the student, parent, and a teacher. These usually are written interviews, not spoken interviews. Um, they can also include interest inventories to see what might be of interest for your student to do after high school. And they can also include hands-on activities and simulated work experiences to really get a sense of um, what your student's abilities are and what, real, what is a realistic goal for them after high school. 
And that's a usually a key piece of the equation is not only what is interesting to your student, but what is a realistic goal. And the DOE often only looks into the interest piece and not into uh, the skill piece. And so if you don't feel like the transition assessment that the DOE is doing provides enough information, you can tell the DOE that you disagree with that assessment and ask to them to fund a private assessment that can really go more in depth into not only what your student's interests are after high school, but what their abilities um, and skills are to determine what realistic goals should be. And because it's a transition assessment, it's not just supposed to be about work. The assessment should relate to, yes, job training, but also education, employment, and independent living uh, goals that a student might have, if appropriate. Okay. And sorry, Julia. Yeah. Speaking of assessments, um, is there a number of how many type of voc vocational assessments there are? Um, I just really want to understand the difference between vocational assessment one and two, and if there's more than to that. Yes. Well, that goes well into my next slide. Um, I can also answer the questions that are in the Q&A briefly. Nancy asked if these transition assessments are mandatory. Yes, they are mandatory. They must be done every year. Yes, you can always ask for a copy. You should ask your school, hey, can you send me copies of the uh, transition assessments that you've done for my student? Assuming your student is 12 or above, um, yes. And Jacqueline, to quickly answer your question too, yes, a student with an IEP can earn a Regents Diploma. Okay, so there, this is a, this is a tricky slide because the DOE actually is now saying that they're getting rid of these level one, two, and three assessments, but this is what currently exists in the DOE's universe. And so I want you all to know this information so you have it and are equipped with it. So currently the DOE has divided transition assessments into three categories, level one, level two, and level three, as Tatiana just touched on. The level one assessments are the only required assessments. Level two and level three are not required. Only level one is required for the DOE to conduct every year. And this is the assessment that includes student, teacher, and parent interviews and is really focused on like asking a student um, to identify, to self-identify what their interests are, what their skills are, um, what they'd like to do after high school. It's very much uh, student driven um, and it's really about a student's interests and their self perceptions of their abilities. A level two assessment is very skill focused. It's supposed to be a formal hands on assessment where a student is engaging in about three to five hours of hands on assessment to assess their skills in different types of work experiences. A level three is even more thorough and comprehensive. It is a 10 day assessment that happens on a job site. So typically the only students who get level three assessments done are students, for instance, in a CTE program or in a school-based internship program where they will be on a job site throughout the semester. And so the school is able to then conduct a really comprehensive assessment of how they're doing on that job site um, in this like quote unquote real or simulated work environment. So as I said, level ones are required for the DOE to do every year once your student with an IEP is 12. Level twos and threes you have to request. So if, for instance, you get a level one and you don't think it provides enough information, you can always ask the DOE to conduct a level two or a level three. A level three is trickier because it requires, you know, 10 days of real or simulated work experience. Access VR, um, which we'll talk about later, can also provide these assessments. So um, you can always request a level two or a level three. Make sure if you request them that you know, what assessment the DOE does meets 
these definitions. So a level two should be three to five hours. It should be hands-on skills-based activities. And a level three should be a 10-day comprehensive assessment on a job site. And again, generally, if a school says, hey, we can't provide that, which often will be the DOE response, you can ask them for an independent assessment authorization so that you can get that assessment done by a provider outside of the DOE because the DOE was unable to provide it for you. Okay. The next part of the law says that appropriate transition goals need to be on a student's IEP. And generally you're using the transition assessments that the DOE has already conducted to create these goals so that they are individualized to the student, they're appropriate for the student, um, and they really touch on um, you know, the different aspects of the student's post-secondary goals, including education and training, employment, and independent living. So while transition assessments happen starting at age 12, the other aspects of the IEP, including post-secondary transition goals, have to happen by the time a student is 15. They can happen earlier if appropriate, but generally they're not required to start including post-secondary goals on an IEP until a student is 15. And as with any other IEP goal, we wanna make sure they're smart, which means specific, measurable, attainable, relevant to the student and time bound, which means that a student could achieve this goal um, in, in a specific amount of time. These are examples of what this can look like on an IEP. In the interest of time, I won't read them out, but these are pulled from real IEPs. Obviously, student names have been changed, but um, you know, this can give you a sense of the fact that these goals are really supposed to be focused on what a student wants to achieve once they leave high school. Okay, you also um, should make sure in transition planning for your students that they have appropriate annual goals on their IEP. Obviously, annual goals are broader than transition goals because they cover academics and related services, but all of these things also contribute to a student's readiness to leave high school prepared for their next steps. And so we also wanna make sure that these annual goals um, are really setting the student up to then be able to meet their post-secondary goals. Next, you wanna make sure that a student is getting appropriate transition services on their IEP. Again, this should happen by the time a student is 15 or earlier if appropriate. And this section of the IEP is really meant to discuss what kinds of classes and related services the student is going to receive to help them meet their post high school transition goals. We wanna make sure that these are again, individualized, detailed and specific. And they should also include a discussion of your student's progress towards graduation requirements if they are working towards a diploma. This is an example of what that section of the IEP can look like. Generally, it is in paragraph form, and it will talk both about the student's progress towards graduation and how they are using their classes and related services to work on their um, goals to help them prepare for life after high school. One of uh, my favorite parts of the IEP next is the transition activities section. Again, this happens by the time a student is 15, earlier if appropriate. And this is really focused on looking to what the student is getting from the DOE, both inside and outside of their classes to help them meet their transition goals. So whereas the prior section was really focused on uh, classes and related services and academic requirements. This section can also talk about things that would happen outside of the typical classroom setting to make sure that the DOE is really preparing your student for life after high school. So an example of this section is here in the IEP. It is called the Coordinated Set of Transition Activities, and it includes several different categories that the school should be thinking about including instruction. So that is what's happening in the classroom to set your kid up to be ready for life after high school. But there are also related services, 
section to explain how the related services your student is receiving can help them prepare. There's also a community experiences section, which should be talking about what types of experiences your school is going to help your student get outside of the classroom to maybe get some work experience or job shadow um, or, or see what types of jobs might be of interest to them or what next steps in their education might be of interest to them. And for other students, we can also include development of employment and other post-school adult living objectives here. This is about resume and cover letters, um, as well as acquiring daily living skills like maintaining hygiene or other independent living skills. And if appropriate, um, a more in-depth functional vocational assessment, which is actually another word that the DOE uses for a level three vocational assessment, which is that 10 day assessment that they might do for a student who is in a work-based learning or CTE program. A really key thing here is that the school should be saying who within the school is responsible for helping your student meet these goals. So you want to make sure that that section does not say that the student or the parent is responsible for meeting these goals. We want to make sure that there is a faculty member at the school who is helping the student work towards each of these different transition activities. Okay. A few final tips about what should happen at the IEP meeting. First, obviously, at every IEP meeting, I would say once your student is in high school, and definitely by the time they turn 15, you wanna make sure that transition goals, activities and services are discussed. You don't want that to be a one sentence thing that's stated and moved on from. You wanna make sure that the IEP team is really creating time to talk about what your students' goals are. Are those realistic? Are there other assessments that you should be doing to figure out what your student needs? and then figuring out what services the, the school can provide to your student to help them meet their goals. So really carving out the time at an IEP meeting to have that conversation is incredibly important. You can always schedule follow-up meetings if you need to. Sometimes IEP meetings just don't give enough time. There's also a figure at every single high school in New York City and many middle schools too called a transition team leader. So this is someone designated at the school to help families and students with the transition from high school to life after high school. If you don't know who your transition team leader is, ask your school principal, ask a guidance counselor, and they can connect you with them to provide additional resources and services. There are also outside agencies that you can always invite to an IAP meeting including folks from Access VR and OPWDD to provide um, more resources and information for your student. And if they can't attend legally, the DOE must take steps to include them in transition planning. So that might mean connecting you with Access VR um, outside of the IEP meeting process to help your student apply for those services. Another important thing is that an IEP meeting can be a really great way for your child to gain some self-advocacy skills and speak up for themselves. Um, helps them create some self-awareness about their disability, how to read their IEP, and you know have a strong sense of what their skills, abilities, and interests are. Obviously, this isn't appropriate for every student, but to the extent possible, it's always great to include students in the transition planning process. Okay, a few final notes. Something that the DOE, I know I've been getting a lot of questions about how to understand what graduation pathway your student is on. So in this slide is a link to AFC's guide on graduation options for students with IUPs. And also legally, not that we've really ever see this happen, the DOE has the obligation to provide graduation requirements in writing at an IEP meeting, and you can always ask for them. And this is another time where you can ask and confirm if your student is on a diploma pathway or a non-diploma pathway. 
you can discuss the safety net options for graduation for your student um, because you know the local diploma has a bunch of different ways that will give a bit more flexibility for students with IEPs to graduate. And you should always, of course, be discussing your child's progress towards all of these goals. We have a transition guide on our website, which will actually be in new updated form in just a few days. And at the back of this guide is this transition planning checklist, which can always also be a helpful way to keep track of your students' progress towards their transition goals. Okay, pause there. Um, Okay, yes, I believe a copy of the slides will be sent. Let's look at the Q&A. Okay, the first question is who administers these assessments at the school? It depends on the school. There's not necessarily a specialized person. Like for a psychoed, you need a school psychologist to administer the assessment. That's not the case for a transition assessment. Um, it, most teachers at the school um, could administer it, but it depends on the school who they've selected to be in charge of it. Typically, you would expect that the transition team leader might be the one administering, but that role at each school is more is uh, a different person in that role in every school, so it would it depend on the school. Um, at what point of the school year after the student turned 12, the school has to do this assessment? So that once your student turns 12, the IEP meeting that happens, once your student turns 12, the transition assessment should happen in preparation for that IEP meeting. Um, so generally within like the month before that IEP meeting, the school should be distributing the transition assessment to conduct. How does a student get a job site with a school? Um, how does this work if you are enrolled in home instruction? No, my. Okay. So typically, a student on home instruction is not going to have access to job um, site experiences because they are on home instruction. Um, once a student leaves home instruction, they can you know, ask their high school what kinds of work-based learning experiences their high school offers. Many high schools do offer these experiences, but not all high schools do. Um, if your high school doesn't offer these experiences, what you can look into is co-enrolling at Co-op Tech, which is um, basically a citywide uh, program that any student in the New York City public school system can in theory access, um, though sometimes there is a wait list and it allows the student to get CTE and work-based learning experiences and work towards different uh, technical and vocational pathways um, for half of the day while attending uh, home, well, sorry, not home instruction, while attending school for the other half of the day. So ask your school what opportunities they provide and you can look into co-op tech um, or a program like Access VR as well, which would be outside of the school day to get work-based experiences outside of school. And Alex will also be talking more about out of school work experiences next. Um, students in a program like Horizon and ACES could work towards a school diploma. ACES is a non-diploma program. If you are in the ACES program, you are not working towards a diploma. Um, Horizons, I would need to quickly look at the criteria, but I believe that in Horizons, you also are not working towards a diploma. Um, but again, you can always ask. Um, okay, sorry, I'm just looking up the criteria. It looks like in Horizons, you, you might be able to work towards a diploma, but in ACES, yes, really. you definitely are not. Okay, thank you. Yeah, for Horizon. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm not as familiar with Horizons, but yeah. In ACES, you are not working towards a diploma. In fact, a criteria for getting into ACES is being alternately assessed. A school every, so the next question is about, can the CSC facilitate a local diploma if the school does not offer? 
that's false. If a school is telling you they don't offer a local diploma, they are wrong. There's not any specific criteria a school needs to have in order to issue a local diploma. The local diploma comes from flexibility in Regents exam scoring. So every single school in the New York City public school system that serves students on a diploma track can issue a local diploma. There is not a there's not a secret list of schools that do and do not offer because every New York City public school can offer a local diploma that is serving students getting diplomas. If your school is telling you that they don't offer a local diploma, call our helpline because that is incorrect information. Thank you, Julia. And for those that are wondering about the Horizon or NEST program, we do have a presentation on our YouTube page about it if you would like more information in detail. Thank you, Tatiana. Okay, I am now going to um, pass it off to Alex, who I believe is going to share. Um, do you want to, I can stop sharing my screen, Alex. Does that work? Yeah, that sounds like a plan. Okay. Um, one second, I'm just pulling up my screen. Can you all see that okay? Cool, thank you. So I'm gonna be talking um, about transition services and transition supports beyond the school setting and, and kind of beyond the IEP. Some of the services that we'll be um, talking about are um, um, uh, within the DOE, and then we're gonna talk about uh, uh, some things within um, uh, outside the DOE, both community-based programs, OPWDD, Access VR. Um, this is going to be a pretty quick overview because we have about 20 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to uh, skip a, a good amount of the slides, but I do want you all to um, know that this information is available. A lot of this is Googleable. A lot of these things, um, different organizations can help you. Obviously, OPWD, which is going to be covered in these slides, is, is something that... Um, is common and many organizations work with. But I think what's important to understand is, you know, when, you, when you're when you a student in the DOE school system, um, uh, everything is kind of within that big system, right? There's still a lot of things, but it's a big system. Once you move on from that system, everything gets a lot more fragmented. There is, um, you know, hundreds of organizations that work on job placement or or community-based internships or schools or training. So it becomes even more complicated, unfortunately, but you have a lot more choices. Um, and that's kind of gonna be the theme that you see as we go through these slides. So first we're gonna be talking about things within the DOE, um, uh, within the public school system. And one resource that we'd like to point you all to is the Transition and College Access Centers, often referred to as the TCACs. So every borough has one. Um, you can click on this link or you can Google it and you'll find the borough uh, TCAC information available. Um, these are centers that are specifically designed to serve students with disabilities and help them with things like um, um, uh, college prep, um, navigating social services, job readiness. Um, and so they have a student facing component where they help um, students and families, but they also do a lot of trainings for DOE staff and give a lot of support to schools so that schools themselves can be more informed about um, um, uh, transition services. This is just a list of some of the things TCAC services can provide if you reach out to them. Um, they do workshops, they do college search, job readiness, they help um, with pre-ed services, we'll talk about that in a second. They do individual consultancies. This is a service we often recommend. You can go there and talk about your transition plan, about your student. They can give you different resources. They can tailor certain services to you and kind of uh, create your own plan. A lot of times, especially because in the IEP meeting transition uh, planning, there might not be enough time. This is an additional resource within the school system for you to come up with a plan. And honestly, when you get a plan or, or you get a recommendation through an individual consultancy through the TCAC, you can take it to the IEP meeting or your IEP team and say, hey, this is what we came up with. I'd like this to be incorporated in our um, uh, in, in my student's IEP. So just to talk a little bit more about pre-ETS, 
PREATS is something that's been offered over the last few years. It stands for Pre-Employment Transition Services. It, although it's funded by Access VR, you don't have to have an Access VR case. You can just apply directly through the TCACs. And this is a set of five courses. It's generally done virtually. Uh, it's done, I believe, over a three-month period or so, about eight to 12 weeks um, after school, where your student can participate in uh, job exploration counseling, uh, work-based readiness training, uh, career exploration class, uh, work-based learning experience class. So there's different aspects to this, but it's all centered around um, um, uh, career exploration, learning about different what are different jobs like? You know, what is it like to be in this job? What works for me? How can I advocate for myself? So it's kind of a nice set of services that are outside of school, but still offered by the DOE to help a student start thinking about what do I want to do in the future? Also, the TCACs play a big role in um, uh, administering the SYEP and top internships. I won't talk about them too much. I'm sure you all know SYEP um, is, is, is a very common program everybody knows about, mostly in the DOE. The deadline did pass on March 15th, but if you happen to miss it and you're interested, um, they might still accept late applications, I'm not sure. And TOP is um, a year-round internship where you work and get paid, um, um, and that is uh, a bit more of a complex application um, that uh, if that's something you're interested in, there's also available online. And the TCACs administer... Uh, both these internships, so you can reach out to your TCACs to uh, talk about these. Um, also, there's a, and a variety of DYCD year-long internship programs. Again, an internship is, is a great way for you to start thinking about your future, getting outside the classroom, working in um, uh, whether it's a, any kind of commercial setting or a school setting or a retail setting. There's many different opportunities in DYCD, which is um, the department for your, for um, Youth and Career Development um, uh, has these internships. And, and I'm not going to talk too much about them. You, you can Google information about them, and there's information here. But there's Learn and Earn, Advance and Learn, and Train and Earn. And there's actually even more than this. But this is just to give you uh, a, a sense of kind of what's available. Um, also, Julia covered it a, a little bit. Um, but vo uh, vocational training, specifically co-op tech, this is a great opportunity for students to really get hands-on training. Uh, they offer 20 different programs, culinary, electrical, you know, very kind of craft-oriented programs to teach industry skills. A lot of times they prepare you for certification. Um, it's a half-day program that generally happens um, after school. So you, you, you may do um, your academics during the morning uh, session and in the afternoon go to co-op tech. Um, um, it's also if you, if you, for high school graduates, um, there's a way that you can enroll as a high school graduate. So, um, um, meaning high school graduates can enroll up to the age of 21. I apologize. So it, 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 even though it's hard, it's a little bit tough to get into co-op tech because um, it's, it's kind of competitive and not everyone gets accepted and there's a waiting list. It's a great opportunity um, for folks to to really come out almost job ready, pretty much job ready, because you get such hands on experience and you get a industry certification. Um, this is just going over some of the D District seventy five training programs. Uh, these are really great programs if, for students in District seventy five to kind of gain experience. Um, Project Search covers um, uh, is through HRC and it's a partnership where you get. It's usually in, in your last year of, of, of high school where you really get to work hands-on at an inter internship. There's a paraprofessional uh, training program where you can go for a year or two, and this often leads to employment. If you finish this paraprofessional training program, um, they will often, um, if you pass uh, the training, offer you a job within District 75 or within the DOE. There's also the food internship program through District 75 where you work as a lunch helper, or within certain cafeterias. And sometimes if positions are available, they will also offer you a job within the school system um, in the lunchroom. There's a CVS internship program um, where students get to you know, have internships at CVS locations. This is just a list of, these are non-DOE programs, but it gives you an example. Uh, Colab is a theater company where students can get free classes and training to kind of practice in the arts. There's also Epic Players. Um, um, and there's a lot of these programs. We've just listed four of different varieties. I, I wouldn't say there's a lot, but there's certainly more than on this list. And again, what, what, why we list these, why we include these, these are all um, programs that are tailored to students with disabilities 
tailored to students with autism. So, um, you know, we're not sending you per se to general ones where you may not have the support that you need. These are all programs that um, are specialized in serving students with disabilities. So we're gonna talk, um, let me pause for questions real quick, and then I'm gonna try to cover college access some more. Um, yeah, the services are, uh, the services are all offered in, I'm not sure exactly which services you're asking about, but of the services, uh, like the D District 75, some of the internships are generally in your last year of high school, so already when you're a senior, but the TCAC centers and the internships, you can access at any point in high school, so some of the services you can access at any time in high school once you transition age, and some of the internships are only for those um, in their last year. So it's kind of specific to each program. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about college. We're just gonna cover this really quickly. Um, college, one thing that's important to understand about college is the IDEA and special education do not apply in college. So once you leave the college, once you graduate high school and you have a diploma, you're thinking about college, there is no IDEA, there is no special education services. And generally, most it's important to know most special education services are not available in college. They're not, uh, colleges are not required to produce uh, smaller classrooms. Colleges are not required to modify information. Colleges are not supposed to provide um, special tutoring and instruction. There is things that colleges do have to provide. They have to provide accommodations. Accommodations look very, accommodations are just one part of the IEP generally, but that is the part that carries over to college. We're going to talk about what those look like in college, but it's important to understand in college, um, the eligibility criteria is a little bit different. Uh, you have to disclose, you have to tell your college, hey, I have a disability, I need these accommodations, you must submit doc documentation. So it's a very different system than what you're used to in school, where the school is responsible for identifying you and offering services. Um, so there's a lot more responsibility on the student. Again, we kind of spoke about this. Um, 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 it's also different in college. If you're not doing well, and even if you have a disability, you can be asked to leave a program. So the standards are different. It's much, um, uh, it's much more responsibility. It's much more... Um, um, uh, on the student to make sure they do well. And, um, you know, uh, because of the way the ADA is structured, um, it's, a, it's a very, very different setting. And I think it's very important to tailor your expectations to college. A lot of times students with disabilities or their parents don't have unrealistic expectations of the type of services or supports they're getting in college. And uh, that ends up being the problem. By no means am I saying that college isn't possible. It is, you just need to plan accordingly um, hey, may, maybe you're not ready for a full-time course load. Maybe you just take two or three classes in college to start. Hey, maybe this college isn't appropriate for me. So all these different considerations that um, you need to take when you're thinking about college. There's different types of colleges. I'm going to go over this very quickly. Every college has to provide you with accommodations, basic accommodations provided under the law with ADA. But then some colleges go above and beyond. They provide learning specialists, they have resource centers, they have academic coaching. Uh, there's a list in the next few slides of some of these colleges. Then there is schools that are full, almost fully tailored to people with disabilities. There's very few um, students with learning disabilities. There might be two programs, maybe three or four programs in the entire country. Landmark College, Beacon College, about 99% of the students in those schools are students with disabilities. Um, and they have smaller classrooms and they do a lot of things, but they are going above what is required by the law and really trying to tailor it to students with disabilities. Again, very few schools in the country who provide this. Also, there's college experience programs. This is generally for students who have IDD. Um, these are programs that are non-degree programs, but students can still participate in a college setting. This is like the Melissa Regio or CUNY Unlimited program. There's also a couple of other programs here uh, in our Northeast area that are college experience programs. And this is generally through Think College. Think College is the national accrediting kind of resource body on these college experience programs for students with OPWD. Um, sorry, with IDD. And often you do need OPWD um, to participate in these programs. So again, this is a high level overview. What else is important to understand is that a lot of the additional supports in colleges sometimes cost extra money. Um, they, uh, right, general accommodations that are required by the ADA are free and they're part of your tuition. But if you need extra academic coaching, you need social support, you need social emotional support, 
um, schools do charge extra for that to use their resource centers, and they're allowed to charge extra according to the law. So this is just a list of general college programs that have um, special support programs for students with disabilities. These is a list of specialized either pre-college or college uh, learning disability programs. Again, you'll get these slides. And this is a little bit of on some of the um, college experience programs that are non-degree programs, but can be a great way for um, students with um, IDD or various other disabilities to, 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 get a, to get a try at college. So again, these are just some slides. You know, when you're thinking about college, it's important to really understand every college is very different. So understanding what's the campus environment like, what's the class environment like, what's, um, 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 you know, what's it all about? You know, what accommodations do they provide? What accommodations do they not, not provide? It's very different in the college setting. Not every college provides the same accommodations. There's unfortunately no national standard. So that kind of um, makes it a little bit more challenging. But this slide, it's very important for you to reach out to the school in advance and find out what information, uh, what accommodations they do provide. So the, this is a little bit detailed. I'm gonna just jump over this. I mean, every accommodation in college has to be individualized. It has to be tailored to your disability. Um, again, assign, if you have a, a professor in college assigns you a, a 10 page essay paper to the class, and you say you have a disability, I, I want to do this as a two page paper. That is not something the college is required to do. That is a fundamental change to an assignment that could be possible in high school, but those kinds of changes to your assignments in college are generally not required. You're supposed to be doing the same work as other students. Now, if you require more time to complete that paper, that could be allowed. But submitting a shorter paper is generally something that would be considered a fundamental alteration. So these are common accommodations, extended time on exams, testing in a private area, having a note taker, um, accessible format, uh, materials, di digital or e-textbooks, assistive technology, um, and housing accommodations. These are things that you can ask colleges for. Here's some more. Um, um, priority registration for classes, um, braille materials, cart services. Um, that's just a, a common list. Things that are harder to get, alternate test formats, generally will not be approved unless you can really show why um, your disability kind of meets, requires that, and it's very difficult to, to, to prove. Um, also, remote learning, hey, like I can't go to college campus. That was kind of common during COVID. It's pretty difficult to get as a disability accommodation now. Um, again, the additional support some colleges have, learning centers, learning specialists, writing centers, tutoring. These are kind of um, uh, a lot of things that students with disabilities should think of to help them get um, the extra support that sometimes they need. Um, students have to make a request to the disability service office. They have to submit documentation. Most very important for you to know, submitting your IEP to the Disability Service Office um, uh, as documentation alone is not sufficient. Disability Services Office require disability documentation from a health treatment provider, whether it's a medical doctor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, that explains the disability. Just the IEP alone is an educational plan. It does not always have uh, the information that's necessary for a college. And importantly, colleges are not bound by the IEP program. Colleges function on a different law and on a different system. So you will have to submit new documentation or whether it's a new neuropsych or something else. I mean, a neuropsych doesn't have to be new for college, but it still has to be recent within the last year or two potentially. Um, but very important to know, don't think you're just gonna apply to college and submit your IEP. Uh, they only look at the IEP as a historical reference. It is not usually something that on its own will get accommodations granted. So I'm going to finish up the college section. I know we're running out of time. Um, this is just how you apply for accommodations. You'll see it here. You reach out and things like that. It, um, we're going to talk about OPWD real quick. I'm going to go over this very quickly just because you all are pretty familiar with OPWDD, I imagine. But it's a big resource for when students are transitioning. These are the criteria. Um, uh, these are kind of uh, the required documentation to get OPWD eligibility. I'm sure um, our friends at Synergia have a lot on OPWD training, so I'm not going to cover too much of this. This is kind of the process. Um, these are the services that you can get through OPWDD. Um, but what's important to know is on my next few slides, um, as we're talking about employment, we're going to talk a little bit more tailored 
on the employment slides that um, OPWD does provide supported employment, pre-vocational services, and community work experience. So those are very tailored um, things. I'm going to take a question or two, and then I'm going to try to finish a couple of the slides that I still have here. Uh, oh, there's only one question. Okay, one question. Yes, we have lot. Well, I don't. Um, first of all, Advocates for Children has some slides. Uh, it has some uh, workshops that are specifically tailored to the things that I'm talking about. We have an hour long, um, more than an hour long presentation just on college alone, where we go into the details of college. We have uh, an hour long workshop and training that is just on work based learning opportunities, talking about all the internships available in the DOE, um, as well as outside the DOE. We have an hour long plus a workshop and training on employment supports, Access VR and OPWD, how they work with employment. So we absolutely do have more in depth things on this. We're just kind of covering them quickly today um, uh, as an overview. And we're happy to either do another training or we do have some YouTube, uh, YouTube videos available um, on the Advocates for Children website. So I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. I know we're already at time, but Access VR is a major, major resource for uh, students with disabilities, again, young adults, students and young adults with disabilities, you do not have to, it, it is not the same standard as OPWD. You do not have to have an, an uh, intellectual or developmental disability. With Access VR, you can have any disability as long as it limits your ability to work. Access VR is solely designed and um, its mission is to help people with disabilities find jobs. So um, generally the criteria is you must be at least 14 years old, you must have a disability, you must be a US citizen. That is a requirement because um, ultimately it's about getting a job. And in order to have working papers and secure a job, you do have to be a citizen. Although um, uh, if you're a non-citizen that is allowed to work, uh, you would also be eligible. Um, so you have to prove that you have a disability and you have to show um, that you can benefit from Access VR services. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but access, I'm not going to cover everything on here, but Access VR, uh, you must have a career goal. You're going to come there, you're going to ask them for help, maybe with college, maybe with something else. We're going to talk about some of the services they cover. You have to have a career goal. If you come to Access VR and you say, I'm not sure what I want to do, they're going to offer you maybe do an assessment, maybe go think about it, take some more classes, but you have to have a career goal and they generally only approve services um, toward an employment goal. Um, this is just kind of to look at some of the things that Access VR covers and OPWDD covers. As you see, there's some things that overlap that they both cover or they both work on. Support employment, job coaching, certain assist technology, e-mods you can get from either agency. But Access VR is very specific when it comes to college support or tuition assistance or competitive employment, vocational and counseling, and an array of other things. Only Access VR covers. Um, so this is just about, you have to turn in an application. It's available on the Access VR website. Everything at Access VR turns pretty slowly. So you should at least apply at least six months to in advance. I recommend a, a year in advance. Um, if you have a specific service or a school or a training that you want to do, um, I do think you should apply a year in advance. By the time you get your interview, by the time the counselor reviews it, by the time there are changes in your career plan, that all takes lots of time. So. I'm just going to cover a few more slides and um, Tatiana, let me know when we uh, yeah. got Alex, right off. before we continue, um, since we only have Martin for our Spanish viewers uh, for a little bit longer, um, mm -hmm. Martin, if you could please share with our Spanish attendees, should they have any questions following up this presentation, they're more than welcome to reach out to me and I'll pass these questions on to Juliet and Alex. Um, just because I know we don't have you for very much longer, um, but I want to make sure our Spanish attendees also have their questions answered as well, whether that be post the presentation. Thank you, Martin. Yep, and I see one question about college. The, sorry, I hadn't seen it before, but what disability documentation is required? A lot of times um, you need something that is detailed that addresses the functional limitations of your student. So let's say, um, well, if you have a learning disability, you'll need a professional that is qualified um, in learning disabilities, generally a psychologist or someone else who can do a neuropsych that explains exactly what are the limitations of the student. So they have trouble with this kind of processing, they have trouble with this kind of thing, they have trouble with that, and the documentation has to also make a recommendation for the accommodations. So they need more time, they need this, that, uh, the other. 
Now, if you have somebody who's a wheelchair user, then you can have a medical doctor, right? Yes, the student has paralysis due to this condition. Um, they need accessible classrooms. They need a little bit more time, et cetera. Maybe the student has um, an anxiety condition that you can do through a psychologist or a mental health professional. So it's gotta be a professional that understands the disability. The disability documentation has to explain how the disability impacts and limits their functioning from an educational perspective. And the disability documentation should make a recommendation for which accommodations are needed in college. Now, if you write a paragraph, uh, the school's gonna, if you just give them a diagnosis, they're gonna tell you, sorry, that's not good enough. You need to have, um, the recommendation is to have something nice and detailed, maybe a page long, being specific, explaining the history, explaining how this works for your student. Because most disabilities um, are different for each student and the colleges do wanna know how it impacts you specifically. For example, just like autism is a spectrum, many other disabilities may not be a spectrum, but at the same time, uh, they, they impact students differently. So the doc documentation has to be detailed. You can't just say diagnosis is X, please provide Y. So I'm just gonna cover this. Um, Tatiana, how much longer can I go or should I should I stop? Um, just checking in with our interpreter just to make sure how much longer we have for Spanish attendees. Uh, just wanna make sure that we can keep going. Just unfortunately, um, our Spanish attendees won't be able to continue listening in Spanish. Got it, um, okay. So I'm just gonna try to cover this one and maybe maybe after I get past so this. Five we'll more talk. minutes um for for interpretation. So you have about five more. Okay, beautiful. I will take those five minutes and finish up then. So these are just some of the services that are provided by Access VR while you're in high school. Again, Access VR has a different level of services that they kind of provide depending on your age. Because look, when you're ready to work, it's whole totally different services than when you're just thinking about working in high school. A lot of time in high school, Access VR doesn't have a lot of things that they provide because you're not really ready to take that employment step, but they do provide for paid internships. They do pre-ed services as well. It's a good time for you to do all your evaluations. Maybe there's a reason DOE is not doing your evaluation. You can get an Access VR case and you can do a vocational assessment. You can do a neuropsych. You can do an assistive tech evaluation. These are all things Access VR pays for. Um, Next up is services after high school. This is a much longer list, vocational counseling, guidance, job training, coaching supports, um, funding for college, tuition, note takers, internships, technology. I mean, it's a very, very big list. Anything that you need to go to college or anything that you need um, to, um, to be able to get a job, Access VR has a very, very lengthy list of supports. Now, Access VR is not like special education services. There is a financial need review. Um, Access VR will look at what your household income is and see if you can afford it or if you have income. That way they have a special calculation that they do and say, well, based on our reading of your household income, you can contribute $1,000 and Access VR will pay the rest. So it's very different than special education or even OPWDD because it is a financial need-based service. So even some of the services on here, um, if you're above the poverty level or uh, the exact um, the exact level kind of varies, um, um, you know you may have to contribute some funds, especially when it comes to college tuition. Also, just because you think you're going to a private university and you think Access VR is going to pay forty thousand dollars a year, that is not the case. Access VR has maximums. They generally provide a maximum of three to five thousand dollars a semester. Sometimes it can go up to ten, depending on the school and what you need. Um, so these are all things to think about, but Access VR can be a great resource. I mean, they could pay a lot, a lot of money for your books, for your colleges, for trade schools, um, for helping you get a job, working with an agency. You know, they, they have a lot of resources available. And specifically, when it comes to job placement, Access VR um, um, works with many organizations who help, uh, you know, find customized employment, find other kind of employment. You know, you're getting a license, they can pay for your license exam. Um, there, there's many, many things that Access VR can pay for. So I, I highly recommend um, this being a resource when you're thinking about employment. Um, Access VR, you've got to stay on top of them. This is all something we know, um, you know, or should know. Um, and you do have to have a career goal. Again, I explained this before. Um, every plan at Access VR is very individualized. And generally, if you come in there and you say you want to be an astronaut, Access VR is going to tell you like, that we don't believe that's realistic at this young age. 
So it's not that they're not going to tell you you can't do that. They're going to tell you, well, why don't we first start with an astronomy degree and maybe you're going to be uh, um, an astronomy, you know, uh, specialist or a sp astronomy analyst. And then as you grow in your career, they will pay for more and more. As you do well, you get grades, you finish certifications. So um, same thing, you want to be a veterinarian, they'll be like, well, first, let's start maybe with some science and biology or veterinary classes and see how you do. Um, it shouldn't be something you're discouraged by, but something to think about um, that it's really a progressive kind of thing. And the more money and the more support they'll give you as you do well. So I think that's it. Access VR just paid for college. I talked about this. Um, these are competitive employment programs that Access VR covers, which I'll cover in my last two minutes. So Access VR does work with employment agencies specifically for competitive employment. Very important. Most of the time, Access VR is designed for competitive employment. When you start thinking about supportive employment, supportive employment is employment, um, which I have a couple more slides coming up on, where you have a job coach and assistance on your job where you're getting paid is something that Access VR does not help you in, um, does not provide assistance for in the long run. When you're first planning those services and you're getting it kind of secured, Access VR will, will assist. Once you need a long-term job coach at your job or someone to be with you regularly, act, uh, that passes off to OPWDD and OPWDD would cover um, the cost of a long-term job coach. So competitive employment refers to traditional mainstream employment. This is like you see jobs listed on Indeed or on any website and you have to submit a resume and go to an interview. That is competitive employment. That's the kind of employment that OPWD, uh, sorry, that Access VR um, tends to support. This just lists a couple agencies that help with um, employment. Again, we have an hour long plus workshop on these specific agencies and kind of what all these services mean. Um, this is just an example of one of the, one of the partners we work with that that works in employment institute for career development. It's a program that's tailored. It's a school that's tailored tailored for students with disabilities, and they have um, lots of career services and job readiness programs. And we we think they're really great and highly recommend it if it's something you're interested in. Also, NYC at Work. This is a program the mayor's office. They help um, students and young adults with disabilities find jobs primarily in the government um, sector, but also in the private sector. And they have a lot of support services um, available um, for you to, to, to take that step to finding a job if you have the qualifications. Um, this is an internship program that's through AHRC and HRA. Um, again, you can use the slide and kind of look through this information, but if you want an internship, doing um, clerical work or data entry and students with IDD often participate in these um, programs. Um, this is a great resource to kind of get some skills and, and do a really hands-on internship. So I think I'm going to leave these last OPWDD slides. This was particularly just, I'm going to click through them just to finish, but this was particularly on supportive employment. So this talks about the difference between supportive employment and com competitive employment, how it's different, how support employment kind of, um, you know, requires long-term um, job coaching and generally goes through an OPWD provider. There are some agencies below that do support employment. Customized employment is kind of a new thing that's come onto the scene over the last 10, 20 years. This is a, a hybrid of supportive employment and, 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 and competitive employment where you work with employers, you don't have a full-time job coach, you do have an assistant at times, but the job is, instead of the job being listed on the market and you apply for it, the agency job path is one of the main providers, works with the employer and specifically creates a job based on your skills. So they look at you, they look at their needs and the job is tailored to your skills, which is very different than competitive employment where an employer just lists your job and then you have to, um, um, the employer lists your job and you apply based on those needs. So this is about job path. They're a big provider of customized employment. Um, these are employment, uh, specific employment services that are available um, through either self, uh, self direction or support, sorry, uh, self direction or support employment. Um, all these programs are either tailored to, to young people with autism or to young people with various um, um, uh, intellectual developmental disabilities. There are ways you can work in graphic design and kind of cooking and culinary, and there are uh, things to think about if you're looking for employment or training programs as you get older. And that's it.
sorry I went over there, but just wanted to cover. Sorry, right, Alex. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I know our interpreter does need to go, but uh, Martin, again, if you could just let the Spanish audience know that they could forward your questions to me, um, and I'll forward those to Alex and Juliet, um, just so they're able to get their answers, that'd be great. Um, for those uh, English speaking attendees, right now we'll go into our Q&A section. So um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or Q&A box, um, and we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you. Yep, I see one question there about um, should you share your neurological report with Access VR? Um, I think so, but I'll give a little bit of a caveat. I mean, look, you do have to establish that you have a disability with Access VR. So you have to submit some kind of documentation. Neurological report is fine. The one thing that I would say, just from having looked at a lot of neuropsychs um, in my career, not as many as Juliet, certainly, but enough of them, is um, if the neuropsych or neurological report really shows that the student is not able, um, shows a low level of functioning or kind of describes maybe you many years ago when you had less skills. That is something that Access VR sometimes would be like, well, based on this neuro, you want to go to college? Well, based on this neuropsych, I don't think there's any way you can go to college because the neurological report might say that, you know, it's not realistic for you, you need more help. So if it's going to be um, detrimental or it doesn't really support that, oh, you're going to have a job? Well, somebody who has these kind of low scores is not going to be able to have a job. Um, you know, maybe instead of giving it to them, you ask them for a new uh, evaluation that kind of shows where your skill level is at. You know what I mean? Because the standard that a lot of neuropsychs happen when you're younger is tailored towards special education. The standard of a neuropsych or a vocational assessment is looking at it from a different lens. And sometimes the Access VR counselor, um, you know, won't fully understand it. Technically, in Access VR, there's no IQ threshold, right? They don't have one per se, but they will say that, hey, look, if an assessment doesn't support what you're asking to do, Access VR says, well, it's not likely that we're gonna what we're gonna pay for is gonna benefit you and get you a job. And if they don't think that it's likely, they are legally allowed to deny the service. So. You know, uh, you certainly want the neuropsychological and other documentation you submit to them to show you have a disability, but you don't want it to be um, so substantially maybe a kind of showing you in such a bad light that it, that it doesn't even support the fact that you can do what you're asking to do. So it's a very gray area. Um, and I just kind of, you know, it's something you can get past. You just need to get a new eval that shows something slightly better or slightly different. But it's something to think about when you're submitting documentation to them which is not the case in college. In college, I say, give them all the disability documentation you can. You know, the more the merrier. Access VR is kind of like unique in that sense. I think that's all my questions. Or are there more in chat? Did I miss them? Uh, don't see any currently. Again, if anybody has questions, I do encourage you to type them into the chat. Um, I do have one question. Um, so who at the DOE level can provide specific information um, about how to access the internship opportunities for students with disabilities? I know that this is a, a topic that I hear a lot in working with parents of how to get those opportunities for their students. Yeah, I mean, one of, I, I mean, th there's two things that I would say. One of the best resources for the internships is the TCACs, the Transition um, College and Access Centers. They administer SYEP and TOP programs, which are the tailored internships for students with disabilities. But you can also ask your school. There's a lot of community-based or school-based internships. Uh, your transition uh, team leader at your school, a transition coordinator might know about it. So um, those would be the, the best ways to get um, information. And every school has kind of their own internships through relationships that they have. So a transition coordinator might be um, a great way to go. Thank you, Alex. Um, and following up on that question, um, can a parent request um, that to be as a goal on their, uh, their student's IEP, a trans transition goal? Yeah, absolutely. Finding a community internship or, or applying to SYEP or uh, whatever it is could absolutely be a goal. Um, you know, I also almost think you should even make it more tailored. Not that you just want an internship, but I want an internship in finance. I'm interested in finance. I want an internship in... Uh, I think my students should have an internship in culinary. They're very interested. So you should tailor it to also your interest. That way the IEP team and the transition team leaders are looking for something that's interested to you because that's something that we also see happen from time to time. Somebody gets an internship, they're very excited about it, 
then it's totally something they didn't want. It's good because like they found out what they don't want to do, but it's not helpful because it's not in their area of interest. Thank you, Alex. And I don't see any more questions as of the moment. Um, if anybody comes up with a question past the presentation, you guys can always let me know and I'll reach out to Alex and Juliet and have that question answered for you. Ms. Voss, I know that you had a little more of a private, uh, uh, Ms. Ross, sorry, uh, question. Um, I can collect, connect you with Juliet um, just to talk more one-on-one -on -one about that. Um, if nobody has any more questions, uh, this presentation will be available um, once it's finished, available directly on Facebook, and it will be on YouTube within the next coming days. You guys will get a present a copy of the presentation slides and all of the resources and links that I might have dropped in the chat for your use. Um, again, if you have any question, uh, we'll forward them to Alex and Julia and hope you get your answer. Um, and yeah, so for those uh, that are still here, please stay just a little bit longer for a poll. And I wanted to thank Alex and Juliet for such a wonderful and important, uh, <clears throat> sorry, webinar today. <clears throat> sorry, wow. Um, again, thank you so much, Alex, Juliet. Um, and we'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tatiana, for organizing all this. We appreciate your, your help. And thank you all for, for joining. Thank you, everybody. So for those on Facebook, I will be ending the broadcast now.